I would like to share a few scenarios which you and I or someone we may know may be facing. What if you have raised your son to be a Christian and he comes home one day and he says, hey dad, I've been talking with a friend of mine and he's been telling me about the Muslim faith and I think I'd like to become a Muslim. What do you do? Or here's a second one. What if you're a teenager? And one parent is a Christian, the other is a Buddhist. And you're kind of confused. You're just not sure which to believe. What do you do? And then here's a third one. What if the parents have a strong religious belief and the teenager decides that he or she would like to have no religious belief? What should be done? These situations can be stressful and confusing for both adults and teenagers. I have been teaching teenagers and young adults for about 20 years. I have taught at junior high, high school, and college levels. And my wife and I have parented two grown sons. And from that experience, I have acquired thoughts as to how we can have positive and helpful dialogue on issues such as these. So how does one break down barriers so as to deeply connect on the sensitive area of faith between teenagers and adults? One way is through a three-point plan that I'm going to share today. The first step is to undergo a comparative faith study of the Bible. The second step will be to go through a process of developing friendship between the teenagers and the adult. And third, go through a process of finding commonalities. The method of study I mentioned is through the Bible. And I would like to share why I chose the Bible. Now, it could be another source. It could be the Koran or some other source. But there are certain reasons I, I would pick the Bible. A few months ago, my wife and I visited the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. And we were impressed with an exhibit. It was called of the Gutenberg Bible. Now, it seems that the Gutenberg Bible was the first major book that was printed using the modern movable type printing press. And I think that that's kind of important because it indicates the place of, in our society of the Bible that it would have that s distinction. Another factor is, according to my research, the, most, the Christianity, where the Bible is the major source of Christianity, it is the most popular faith worldwide. Based upon statistics from Wikipedia, there are currently 2.4 billion Christians in the world. Also, the second most popular faith is the Muslim or Islam faith with 1.7 billion followers. Then comes the Hindu faith with 1 billion followers. And then fourth is the Buddhist faith with 0.5 billion followers. When we go to the second most popular faith, which is the Islam or the Muslim faith, their major book is the Quran. Now, the Quran refers to the Bible. It refers also to characters in the Bible, such as Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. It was written after the Bible. The other, for the other religions I mentioned, the Hindu faith and the Buddhist faith, they have many writings, but they don't have a central book, as does the Islam or the Christian faith. So I think if we take all those together, a good starting point for a comparative faith study would be the Bible. And I'm going to say more about my plan for a Bible study later in my talk. Let me now go to the next two steps of my plan. A driving force of this plan is to develop friendship. And I learned that through playing tennis. 
Now, I love to play tennis, and I play tennis about three times a week, and most of my tennis buddies are Vietnamese. And they will, we will get to talking, and they will share why they came from Vietnam, what it's like here in the United States. And it even sometimes it gets on to spiritual issues. For example, one of my friends, he shared with me, I can't understand what's happening in the Middle East. It's just terrible the way people treat each other. And we agreed that his belief, which the Buddhist faith and mine, the Christian, we would not tolerate such behavior because we each believe you should love your neighbor. So I learned something. Another example where I learned the power of friendship towards connecting was with my mother-in-law. Now, my mother-in-law, she's 89. And I remember at once she, after she started living with us about three years ago, I tried to think, well, what can I do to help our relationship? And I decided, well, I know that when I was young, my mother used to read stories to me, and it really helped our bond. And so I thought, well, what if I read stories to my mother-in-law? And so every day for over a year, I've been reading stories to my mother-in-law. And I've read virtually all the Oz books, all the Jules Verne's books. We've read Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn. And it's just been great. It's really helped our bond and our relationship. In fact, now she's my friend. And she, she knows that, that it's important for me to turn off the lights. So she'll say, hey, Dave, you left on the lights. And so it's just, been, it's just been a much stronger and a great relationship because we have developed that friendship. And I would like to suggest, as part of my overall plan, is that while you do a comparative face study, you develop your friendship. And if, for example, you could do a sport together or, 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 or some other way. Or, or you could compare, maybe you each read a book together or you share a book that you're each reading. The third point of my plan and that is to develop commonalities. And I learned of that through teaching math. Now, something that I discovered when I taught math was that students often had math anxiety. And they often were afraid to come up to the board, particularly if they struggled with math. And I, I, I would ponder, how can I have students come up to the board and ask questions and not be shy about it? So I came up with this plan. What I decided I would do is I would tell them where I'm weak in. And I said, told them one day, I said, you know, obviously I'm good at math, but there's areas I'm not very good at. And one example is I'm not very strong at mechanical things. And I give a story. I said, one time I was trying to fix our front door, and I messed it up so much I just locked myself out of the house. And I, I ended up calling a locksmith, and cost me several hundred dollars. But I realized I need to work on that. I can't just be paying people to do things all the time. And so I have to work on that. And then I, so I encourage them in the same way, maybe if you struggle with math, it's important to work on it because it's probably going to be important for you in everyday life to be good with numbers and, and on your job. And you know what happened? They started coming to the board more. And they would ask questions because they realized, I admitted I had weaknesses myself. And I wasn't going to likely embarrass them in front of their friends. One other example, as far as commonalities, is with one of my two sons. And as it turned out, when one of my sons was a teenager, we, my wife and I felt like we kind of lost some ground with him in our communication. And he, he went away to college, and when he came back, what we decided to do is we would suggest to him, let's go on a trip together. And so, so he decided that he would, and this would be to celebrate his graduating from college. So he decided that he would go to Japan. And so we went to Japan, and he picked the itinerary. He picked where, what he would like to do and what we would like to do. And it was just a really a super experience. One of the things that we really enjoyed was going to a Japanese baseball game. 
And he always loved baseball growing up. And so it was just so much fun to, to watch the uh, Japanese baseball game, see how it was a little different from the United States baseball game. But it helped our relationship, and it helped us to now communicate more in a deeper level than we had been able to do before. So I would suggest that while you, if you, you undergo this method that I'm suggesting, that you undergo a process of building, finding commonalities. And it, it might be go to a movie together, or it, or it might be going on a fun trip. Let me now go back to the interface study, the more the details of it. How, how would this take place? The first thing I would suggest is to obtain a, a good Bible resource guide to guide you through this, because it'll help you to stay on track and to be focused. Now, one that I'll suggest is a book that I wrote. It, it's called A Path Through the Bible. And I think that this is a good one for an interface study because of the way it's written. First of all, it's written not from a lecture point of view, but from an exploring point of view. And you can kind of get the idea from it. It says, unlock the meanings from the whole Bible. You're exploring it. You're discovering it. I also, it was written to be kind of like a scientist would in, uh, investigate a hypothesis. And I tried to pick out what are the key things to look at to try to understand and evaluate this, this book. So, for example, there, there is a, a definite plan. What, what do you read each day so that it'll be a few chapters a day? Uh, second, you journal. There's space to journal. And you write your ideas, what are you saying, so that you can then share it later with your friend. Also, there are thoughts from other people. What did they learn from the same material? What did they think it meant? And then you can compare your thoughts with what other people have thought. Also, there are themes and central ideas of what I think are most important from my perspective and what I've learned. And then also there's photos uh, from Israel uh, that will help people to identify just really what are the real places that are in Israel that cor correspond to biblical events. So, for example, there's a photo of the Garden of Gethsemane and that uh, where, where Jesus prayed before he was crucified that I think makes it more concrete in reading the Bible to see actually see what these places look like, a lot of these places that you read. Now, as you're using your resource guide, what you want, what I would suggest is look for commonalities. And I've already talked about that, how commonalities bring you together. Well, look for commonalities between the Bible and this, the faith that you're, you're interested in, in, in studying. And one example that you can bring out that you should be able to find is called the Golden Rule. Now, as it turns out, the golden rule, which is do unto others what you would have them do unto you, is, tr is, is taught in virtually every major religion. Confucianism, Buddhism, Muslim, Judaism, they all, they teach this. But they teach it, maybe say it in just a little bit different words. So, for example, if it's the Islam faith, it will say, not one of you truly believes in you wish for others what you wish for yourself. Very similar. If you were to look at the Hindu faith, they will say it as this is the sum of all duty that you do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. Similar. If you look at the Buddhism faith, they will say treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. So we see these similarities. This is just an example with the other major faiths. Let's now go to the Muslim faith and look at what you can bring out if you're studying the Muslim faith. Again, the Muslim faith focuses on the Quran. That's the central book they have that they study. One of the things about the Muslim faith that's similar with the Bible is that they have roots back to Abraham. They each 
have the forerunner of the faith is Abraham, the starting point. They also, they both believe in one God, and then they have some common leaders and examples that they look up to, such as Joseph, the son of Jacob, and Moses, and they, they have that in common. And these are things to bring out if we are studying this together. Now let's look at the Hindu faith. The Hindu faith, they have many writings, as I mentioned, but one that was very popular with Mahatma Gandhi, and it's called the Bhagavad Gita. Now this book is kind of like a guidebook for life. It tells you what do you do in different situations, which in many ways is how the Bible is. It's, it's also kind of like a guidebook for life. So we have that in common between an important book, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Bible. Now, if we go to the Buddhist faith, again, many writings, but two that are very important. Are, are one is called the Four Noble Truths, and the other is called the Eightfold Path. The Four Noble Truths talks about the nature of life and the struggles that we all have and frustrations that people have. The Eightfold, and, and in many ways, that's like the idea of sin in the Bible, struggles in life. But then the Eightfold Path talks about behaviors that we need to have and what we need to avoid, kind of like the Ten Commandments. In fact, in common with both the Eightfold Path and the Ten Commandments is you should not steal, you should not lie, and you should not kill. So we have many examples that are in common that we want to bring out to get this common ground between the teenagers and adults. Is this needed? We need to have that. And the teenagers need to be encouraged with that. But at the same time, we're going to need to look at the, the differences. And there'll be important differences. But we should address those, not to stay away from them. But I found that a good way to do that is through sharing. Share your personal experience. If you have an experience that relates to an important difference, Nobody can argue experiences or be offended. They're not likely going to say, oh, you hurt my feelings because that happened to you. That's not likely going to happen. And so, for example, I could share about the, the Christian faith from my study of an experience with the Christian faith. I found that the central aspect is a personal relationship with the person Jesus. Now, I could share how that relationship has affected me personally. And I wouldn't, affect, I wouldn't expect my friend to be upset by that because I'm merely expressing my experience. So what, what, is, what is my suggestion for you? The first thing is to decide. Is there someone that you know, that you care about, that you would like to invite for a process like I'm suggesting? And if so, inv invite them. Say, let's try it. Let's do a study like this and do the things that have been suggested, building our friendship, finding commonalities, obtaining a, a Bible resource guide of your choice, such as a path through the Bible. And then follow the plan. Follow the... the the Bible resource, what it says, suggests, and then do what I have suggested. So that would mean, first, look for commonalities. Look for things that you can find in common between the Bible and the faith. Then address differences, but not in an attitude of lecturing, but in sharing. And at the same time, find ways to help your friendship, build your friendship, or, and to find commonalities, such as doing a sport together or going on a fun trip. If I were to summarize this process in one word, that word would be kindness. And I would like to thank a group that's been very kind to me. They're called a Toastmasters group. 
the Achievers 9331, that's been very kind in giving me many suggestions and help with my talk. And I would like to end with a quote by Mark Twain. He said, Kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Thank you. Mm -hmm.